Hello, welcome to another episode of PHI, Public Health Impact. I'm Cham Dallas. And I'm Phaedra Corso. In today's topic, we are talking about injury and violence prevention, and we'll be talking to several experts here at the University of Georgia to learn about their research in this area. Yeah, you know, injuries, that includes unintentional injuries, such as motor vehicle crashes and fires, and intentional injuries, such as violence and suicide. So Cham, this is a very timely discussion, right? We have seen lots of violent episodes yeah in the United States uh, in the last several months, and we have this heightened awareness of the distracted driving that's going on. Yeah, uh, violence is not going down anytime soon. It's, it's on the ramp, and I think we can just expect that. So one would think that the research and the funding uh, should follow that. It's the leading cause of death for people under the age of 35 injuries, but we don't see federal funding or state funding kind of following that, that high level of incidence, unfortunately. So Phaedra, this is your area of research, violence and injuries. Um, tell us about uh, the, the fundamental aspects of this research that you've been doing for quite a while now, not just here at the University of Georgia, but back at the Centers for Disease Control. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I, um, I actually started in this area of research when I was working at the CDC in the Division of Violence Prevention, and um, I do economic evaluation research for a living, as you know, and one of the first things that they asked me to do when I came to the Violence Prevention Group is to assess the costs of violence and injuries in the United States. Over $406 billion spent on medical bills. That, that's just huge. And let me tell you what's in that $406 billion price tag. That includes health care costs for people who experience injuries, but it also includes productivity losses. So not just me missing work because I had a violent episode occur, but it's also for those people who are murdered and they don't get to fulfill their potential. We look at their lifetime potential earnings as a, as a cost as well. Yeah, and back in my field with 180,000 deaths, in a year and millions, 29 million emergency room visits. It's just, th these are just really hard numbers to get your hands around, they're so large. That's right, and so that's for injuries um, in total. I have focused my research in child maltreatment prevention and one of the things that I'm really interested in is how cost effective our interventions are in preventing child maltreatment um, and then also how much society is willing to pay to prevent child maltreatment. Yeah, that can be a problem, especially now as healthcare reform is defining what we're willing to pay as we expand the coverage that we have and hopefully to improve the quality of care. What are we willing to pay for this if we're really going to stop it? Yeah, so we, we did one uh, study here in the United States where we found that um, when we presented a sample of of respondents with a risk reduction, a mortality risk reduction that um, overall, society would be willing to pay $14 million to prevent a death associated with child maltreatment. So that's, that's, a, that's a very large value of statistical life, if you will, relative to um, how we might value a grown adult, right? We, we value our children a little bit differently than we value adults. It's interesting, though, how that does not match with the resources that we're actually putting into it. Even though we, we want to, it's of great value to us, as it turns out, we're not actually dedicating the resources to it. Right. And one of the things we've done this year is we have taken our U.S. results and we have replicated the same study in Ecuador with one of our students who graduated from the DRPH program. And we found that um, the Ecuadorian population that we asked about willingness to pay came up with almost identical willingness to pay amounts to, pr to save the life of a child from maltreatment. So that was encouraging that we are finding um, kind of robustness across populations. Yeah, well, it doesn't surprise me that, that people around the world <laughs> value their children. Uh, it would be nice if we would uh, back that up with, uh, with the appropriate resources and funding to do something about it. So we have a great show today, Chan. We're going to be interviewing um, people in the College of Public Health and in the Department of Sociology as well on uh, violence and crime and injury. Um, and we're also going to be talking to Deb Howery, who's the director of the Emory Center for Injury Control, an important external collaborator for us here at UGA. We're 
now being joined by Dr. Pamela Rapinez, who is a professor in the Department of Health Promotion and Behavior. Pamela, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Fedra, for inviting me. And you're doing some really fascinating research and have been for quite a few years now in the area of violence prevention. I was wondering if you could start by telling us what you're doing in the area of dating violence. Well, let me start by telling you some about our study. We follow over 600 students for seven years. They started in sixth grade and all the way up to 12th grade. Mm -hmm. And we asked teachers to rate their skills and we asked the students to complete a survey for us. And every year we did this. And so we know that kids follow different trajectories over time in different behaviors. So what kind of behaviors are you asking about? One survey? of them is about dating and mm -hmm. dating violence. Okay. So what we found is that a large number, about two thirds of them, are not involved in dating violence. They're dating, but there's no violence in their relationship. And that is physical or psychological. But about one fourth, there is violence, psychological and physical. And, and is, does this hold for both um, boys and girls that you're that following? Boys and girls, that, that's true. And so the kids who are involved in dating violence are also involved in a number of other behavioral problems. They are more likely to have been in a fight with their peers. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to have carried a gun okay. or to have threatened someone with a gun. They're also more likely to be depressed. So you're, so you're essentially trying to figure out what are the risk factors for the dating mm -hmm. violence. What's interesting of this research is that we're following over time. For example, if you examine on sixth grade, the kids who are involved in dating violence, they tend to say that it's okay to hit someone, mm -hmm. but that those norms decrease over time. So more kids say, no, it's not okay to hit someone. But the dating violence does increase. Hmm, interesting. So we see a pattern that it's interesting to study over time because one behavior that we would expect that would be a predictor in sixth grade doesn't change the same way as they move into high school. And so are you also tying these behaviors or risk factors to their educational outcomes? That's correct, yes. So that kids who are involved in dating violence are also more likely to drop out of high school. And you know, one of the things in violence, I, when we're talking about um, about risk factors, sometimes it's different if you're a victim of violence versus being a perpetrator. Have you found differences in risk factors between those two groups? Well, what we found is that there is a very, very high association between victimization and perpetration of dating violence. About 90% of the kids report both, either none or both. Wow, so, so it's just a beha there's a behavior, there's a pattern yes, in the there's a pattern. So it's not like one is being the victim, passive victim. If mm -hmm. there is a fight, they're both fighting. So I know some of the other research you're doing in violence prevention is around bullying um, in particular. What, what kind of research are you doing and what are some of the important findings? Similar, we also in this same study, we examine violence against peers. And there are some kids who are reporting violence throughout another group that's supporting no violence throughout, and another group that is very high in middle school and then changes. And are, we, and are you talking about perpetration and victimization in the same? Yes, yes, both. And again, it just seems, seems to get it, go together. The work that you're doing, um, will, it, will it help to develop interventions to prevent the violence that's occurring, especially maybe in the middle school er time? And I think part of what we're finding is that we need to go before middle school. Because mm -hmm. some of the findings show that there's already a pattern of violence in sixth grade okay. that is probably reflective of something that's going on at home. Mm -hmm. So it would be very important to address these problems earlier. In the College of Public Health, we always try to bring students into our research. Ha have you been able to do that with your bullying and dating violence prevention? Yes, we've had many students work with us, some of them in data collection, in intervention, in data analysis. In fact, the majority of the articles that have, we have published are co-authored with students, and some of them are students are the first authors. And where do you typically get your funding? The majority of it has been from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. 
And they've made bullying and dating violence prevention one of their research priorities? It is, youth violence in general is one of their research priorities. Okay, great, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. We're now being joined by Jody Clay Warner, who is a professor in the Department of Sociology. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so um, I think you're doing some pretty interesting work in the area of violence um, that's a little bit different than mm -hmm. what we do in public health. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us about it? Sure, so what I'm fundamentally interested in is societal and individual level responses to sexual victimization. So um, unlike many people in the field of public health who are focused on intervention and prevention, I'm looking sort of one step back what happens when women um, experience sexual violence and how does society respond to that? So in particular, um, I have investigated reporting behaviors. Uh, under what circumstances do women report and to whom do they report, for example. Mm -hmm. I've also looked at how the situational aspects of the assault itself affect both resistance strategies and the success of those resistance strategies. And do you look at certain um, do you look at all sexual assault mm -hmm. or on, like in, on campuses mm -hmm. or, or, or are there different populations that you're looking at? So far I've mainly investigated um, sexual violence in large-scale national surveys. Mm -hmm. So I haven't focused in on any particular populations, but we certainly know that women on campus um, experience a particularly high victimization rate. And so what are some of the important findings from your research? Well, I think some of the more interesting findings have to do with the way that women respond in the sexual assault situation itself. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, one study that I conducted um, with one of my former graduate students, Jennifer McMahon Howard, who's now at Kennesaw State University on faculty, uh, we've discovered that when women, um, when women are attacked by intimates, that they actually are less likely to use effective resistance strategies. The resistance strategy that women who are assaulted by men that, with whom they've had a romantic relationship tends to be verbal attempts, right. um, which we know from pre past research is, tends to not be very effective. And then I found in this same study as well um, that those women um, were much more likely to be victims of completed assault. Um, when they use those kinds of strategies. I can see the bridge now to public mm -hmm. health, which is we would take that information mm -hmm. and help develop strategies or interventions to help mm -hmm. women in these situations. Yes, exactly. So um, we're going to be talking to Deb mm -hmm. Howery a little bit mm -hmm. later from the Emory Center for Injury Control. How are you um, affiliated with the center? Well, I am a faculty affiliate with mm -hmm. the center. Um, and I've actually had several students who have been involved in the center in multiple ways. For instance, my former student, Jennifer, who I referenced earlier, um, recently received a pilot grant on oh, um, one of her own independent projects now. Um, and I also have a student, uh, Jackson Bunch, who's finishing his degree here at UGA and is about to become an assistant professor at the University of Montana, um, who's currently being funded by the center as well. And so um, what kind of courses do you teach in mm -hmm. this area? Um, I teach a graduate level course on gender crime and justice. Um, and it's a, it's a course that incorporates um, both gender theory and crime theory. Um, we look at um, both women as perpetrators, women as victims, and even women as uh, workers in the criminal justice system. And you're a sociologist by training. I know in public mm -hmm. health we have sociologists mm -hmm. um, on faculty as well. What kind of bridges between sociology and public health mm -hmm. do you see um, in the future, especially in the area of violence? Um, well, as you know, there are many sociologists who, in fact, work in the field of public health, and what those people bring to the table, and that I think that sociologists here at UGA could bring to the public health table, um, is an understanding of the basic social processes that are occurring, um, both during the process of victimization and also the processes that um, are occurring when people react to victims. Mm -hmm. Understanding those social processes then leads to more effective prevention and intervention efforts. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. Great. Thank you. We're now going to turn our attention to one of our external collaborators that we have in injury and violence prevention. I'm happy to be joined here by Dr. Deb Howery, who is the director of the Emory Center for Injury Control. Thanks so much for being here, Deb. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Pedra. Um, so I, I know a lot about the Emory Center for Injury Control. I've been part of your group from the very beginning. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what your mission is? Sure. Well, I joined the Emory Center for Injury Control in 2002 as the Associate Director and then became Director in 2006. And when I first moved to Atlanta, I realized a lot of the research I was doing was very siloed. I didn't know a lot of collaborators who were doing similar work. And so I started reaching out, looking for people interested in violence, particularly violence against women, found many throughout my university. 
and um, being an ER doc, I tend to get bored. So I started looking throughout the city and found a lot more collaborators, not just in violence against women, but all aspects of injury and violence, from car crashes to elder maltreatment, and really started trying to grow our center that way and identifying collaborators. We now have about 150 faculty involved in our center from wow. nine universities, mm -hmm. and our mission is simple simple but complex, to reduce injuries and violence in Georgia to really impact our community. So tell us about the collaboration you have with the University of Georgia. So University of Georgia, um, Phaedra, um, <laughs> was very helpful in starting this. When I was first applying for the Center Grant, um, I approached people I knew and you were one of them and from that we now have eight faculty at UGA who are involved. I believe some of them may be speaking today, like Pamela Orpinas. We funded one of her projects to mm -hmm. look at violence among youth. Similarly, um, we've funded many students to have scholarships. One looked at injuries in firefighters. And we are starting a new policy corps, which you are the associate director of. My hope is that we'll really be able to branch out, do more on policy and translational research, and really involve even more UGA faculty. I came out last year and met with many faculty and students really hoping to encourage our collaborations. So let's talk about the student scholarships a little bit more. What, uh, how much is it and what does it do for them? So the scholarships range from 500 to 2,000 and it's for them to do a project on injury or violence and really all they have to have is a mentor. It doesn't have to be anybody at Emory or in Atlanta. Most of them have worked with folks at UGA, the UGA students who've gotten it. And it's usually done over the summer because that's when students have a bit more time to do it. They send a proposal to us with what the project is. We evaluate it and rank them by competitiveness. And UGA students have done extremely well with, again, four having been awarded out of the past four years. So you talked about policy as one of your um, main core, which I'm thrilled about. <laughs> um, but in addition to policy, what else are your, are your key missions or goals as part of the center? So one of it is to really focus on translational research or looking at when you have an effective evaluation or intervention, how do you then see how it works in other settings. So really doing a lot of dissemination and implementation research. Again, seeing how we can get effective practices out to the community. Similarly, I want to do a bit more with advocacy and policy along mm -hmm. those lines. You know, evaluating research, evaluating policies as part of research and working closer um, with our legislatures. I'm in Leadership Atlanta this year and that's really helped me understand the value of connections and networking and doing more for our community. So my hope is that our center will help advise on policies that can, again, improve the lives of our citizens. And I guess the other big thing is um, Emory became a safe community last year, designated by the National um, Safety Council. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean? So we're actually the second university in the nation to have that designation now, and the mm -hmm. first community in Georgia. It means we're committed to preventing violence and injuries doesn't mean that we've solved it. It just means that we have an approach, to, a unified approach to it to where we look at what the injuries are, how we can stop them, and how we can be proactive in preventing future injuries. My hope is actually to apply for a Safe Community Atlanta designation. That's great. So that would be the other thing on the horizon for the next two years. And how are you working with communities exactly? Um, several different ways. One is um, Georgia's Department of Public Health, their Injury Advisory Committee actually co-locates their meetings with ours so that we've got great translocation of both um, practitioners and researchers. We're also the research arm for the Metropolitan Atlanta Violence Prevention Program, so we work hand in hand with a lot of the grassroots organizations. And we invite different community groups to participate in our center and provide free technical assistance for them. And so if I'm a community group and I'm mm -hmm. hearing about you for the first time, how would we get in touch with you? So our center is very easy to find, emorycentorforinjurycontrol.org. I also am on Twitter at, at Deb Howry or em, at emorycic. We, on our website, um, have forms for technical assistance to where if community members want to have a, a program evaluation, us give a talk, anything like that, we're happy to do that. In addition, we have brown bag lectures on things ranging from social media to specific topics like child maltreatment, and those are all podcasts on our website as well. Great. Well, thanks so much for being here and for collaborating with UGA. Absolutely. Thank you. We're now being joined by Dr. Carol Cotton, who is the director of the Traffic Safety Research and Evaluation Group. Carol, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Again. <laughs> Again, yes. Um, so we've spent a lot of time on the show talking about intentional injuries, but I know your work is in unintentional injuries. Can you share with us what you're doing in that area? 
Unintentional injuries, well, to define that, uh, we think of them as adverse events without premeditation, uh -huh. which is a mouthful to say that things happen, that you don't intend to be hurt when you go outside and something may fall on you or you may get caught or cut by something, and those are unintentional events. So we are in the traffic safety area, and we think of those events, crashes, injuries, the fatalities that come from traffic, as being unintentional events. Also pedestrians, bicycles, scooters, motorcycles are all within that area of traffic safety. And how long has your um, research and evaluation group been around? I've been working in traffic safety at the University of Georgia since 1997 when the law was passed to reduce the BAC, the blood alcohol content for alcohol involvement in traffic safety, mm -hmm. the TADRA, the Teenage and Adult Driver Responsibility Act. Right. And that's where we really got started looking at the effect of law on behaviors. And since that time, we have been funded every single year since 1997 by the Governor's Highway Safety Office, the Governor's Office of Highway Safety here in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And they have asked us to look at all kinds of things. We've looked at bicycles and pedestrians. We've looked at young drivers. We've also looked at traffic safety in rural areas. We've looked at um, binge drinking. We've looked at drinking on college campuses. Just mm -hmm. everything there is to do with traffic safety. And so do you, what, what kind of research does that entail? Is it survey work? Is it focus groups? I mean, give me an example of what you might do in any given year for the governor's office. We send out surveys, typically. That's the kind of research that we do. We do, haven't done any focus groups at this point. They haven't asked us to do that, and it's not really been the relevant kind of data collection that's, um, we're, that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we've surveyed the Georgia population about their knowledge about law. We've sur surveyed them about their behaviors, their perceptions. Do they know about some campaigns like Click It or Ticket or Move Over Law, the different new campaigns that are rolled out by either our National Highway Traffic Safety Administration or by our Governor's Office of Highway Safety. And what have you been finding? Are we typically knowledgeable about these laws or ignoring the laws? Well, what's, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> that is not as, not as good, we're not as knowledgeable as we thought we were. Mm -hmm. um, but that's because we ask very specific questions. It is difficult to remember the, the numbers when it comes to a legal BAC, for example, 0 .02. But what we're really interested in knowing is, do you know what that means? When I say, do you know what that means? Do you know how much alcohol that is? Do you know what behaviors are presented? Do you know, do you know it when you see it, when someone is staggering or they're stumbling or they're slurring their words? What does that mean as in terms of level of impairment? And should they or should they not get behind the wheel of a car? Whether it's legal or not is not really the issue for us. Although it is important to know the legalities, it's also important to know what behaviors keep you sick. So Carol, have you found that the differences in knowledge of the the negative behaviors while driving differs by age or gender? What we're seeing is the younger the person, the more knowledgeable they are about the law. Mm -hmm. And we think that's probably because they get that information in high school, and then they also have education courses at college levels, and they are thinking about it a lot, as young students sometimes are focused on alcohol, perhaps. Right. And so they are very knowledgeable. They know where that line is. The older you get, the less important it becomes for you that you aren't breaking the law, so you don't need to know exactly where that line is. Mm -hmm. But it also becomes just a part of your very other active life. Mm -hmm. And so we do see that as we survey people about the knowledge of, of the law. It almost suggests that we need a booster course at some point in our life on you know, the right behaviors while you're driving. I, compl I completely agree with that, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I've thought about that as uh, an option perhaps in Georgia. In Georgia, we do a really good job though. We're one of the states that is at the forefront of traffic safety. Our Governor's Office of Highway Safety is very open to innovation. They've been part of demonstration projects with at the national level for several years. Mm -hmm. And so we really have uh, a group of professionals around us that support what we do. So tell me what you do on campus around traffic safety. Well, um, every year there is the National Public Health Week and we do focus a lot on traffic or on pedestrians and bicycles, those kinds of things, because that's what our, our population at the campus is most affected by. When they get off a bus, are they supposed to wait on the sidewalk or can they just walk in front of that bus and walk into traffic? The use of crosswalks is very interesting here. Right. Bicycles are also very interesting here because the numbers of people we have that are pedestrians as well as bicyclists. Our president, President Adams, has really wanted to make this a walkable campus. Mm -hmm. And having done that, he's done a very good job at that. What he's done is, is 
interface the pedestrians with what's left of the traffic that's on campus. So we have to be with him and participate in that to make sure that people aren't less safe, but they're more safe. And how do you get students involved? Well, we have an assistantship within the funding that we have. So a student works with us every single year. The current student that we have is interested in pedestrians. Mm -hmm. And so she's developing a project where she's going to actually go out into Athens and around campus and observe people using crosswalks. And then she's going to ask them some questions, person-to-person uh, -person interviewing, to see what their perceptions are. What we hope that she learns is something that we can use to actually increase the safety of the use of crosswalks, and perhaps uh, our engineers can use that information as well. That's great, Carol. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So today we focused on the injury and violence research that's going on here at the University of Georgia campus. If you need more information, you can go to one of these additional websites, such as the Centers for Disease Control, the Emory Injury Prevention, and the uh, Traffic Safety Research and Evaluation here at the University of Georgia. And don't forget to join us for the last show of the season of PHI Public Health Impact, where we celebrate the end of the academic year in looking at faculty and student honors and the 2013 College of Public Health graduation.